Making an album that follows a central concept is quite a difficult task and doing it well is one of the greatest achievements any musician can pull off. When you think of some of the greatest albums of all time, many of them follow a central concept. And in this little video, I want to talk about an underappreciated album that I believe does this really well. Now, I know I normally talk about Australian music, but I recently re-listened to this album from a British band called Basement, and I thought that I just really wanted to make a video about their last album they brought out called Beside Myself in 2018. And it's been five years since that release of the time of me making this video, and I think enough time has passed to really look at this album in hindsight and think it's just an awesome, underappreciated piece of work. So if you don't know who Basement are, they are a British post-hardcore pop-punk sort of emo band that were big in the early 2010s in that kind of Tumblr scene along with the likes of The Story So Far, Title Fight, Citizen, those sorts of bands. They formed in 2009 in the town of Ipswich in the UK and steadily built up a local fan base in England and pushed their way forward to eventually be signed to the label Run for Cover. They put out their first album called I Wish I Could Stay Here in 2011, which was pretty well received in England and put them on the map musically in the post-hardcore scene. In 2012, they actually announced that they were going on an indefinite hiatus slash breakup and with that brought out their second album called Color Me and Kindness. Now this release of their second album turned out to be kind of the perfect storm because the album was received so well and with the information of the band going on hiatus, I think it almost kind of gave the album a lot more publicity for that reason because so many people were sad that they weren't going to get more basement music potentially ever. Now when most people think of Basement, they often bring up this album as their best and this song, Cover, which was the main single from it, is probably their most recognizable. But a couple of years later, they got back together and recorded some new music and eventually released their third album in 2016 called Promise Everything which was a pretty solid return and got them more notoriety in the UK, America, and in Australia, which is where I was first introduced to them to hearing their music on Triple J. Then in 2018, they released their fourth album called Beside Myself, which is what I want to talk about today because I feel like this is their best album and an extremely underappreciated piece of work. So, in an interview that the lead singer and main songwriter of the band, Andrew Fisher, did with the website Kill Your Stereo, he spoke about this album and the interviewer was asking him a lot of great questions about the meanings of songs, the themes of the album, and he answered one of the questions in a way that kind of prompted me to come up with the idea of this video because he kind of just said you can take out of it what you want when it comes to the meaning of songs and the album and I want to kind of take out my interpretation of what I think Andrew was getting at with the songs that he's put out and also how they kind of resonated with me and my mind and how I like them. So before I start talking about Beside Myself I think one really important thing we've got to talk about is why the band actually went on indefinite hiatus in the early 2010s uh, when their second album was released. And it was actually because the lead singer and main songwriter Andrew Fisher wanted to become a teacher and he needed to finish his studies and start getting into the field of teaching. And interestingly, the subject that he taught was religious education. So I don't know if Andrew has a religious background, if he's a Christian person, or maybe he was a Christian person, or I don't know, maybe he's just interested in religion generally, but he often does put a lot of kind of biblical messages in his songs and references words that were common in scripture. For example, the word covet, their biggest song, um, being one of the Ten Commandments. Also, Brothers Keeper from Promise Everything, I guess, alludes to the story of Cain and Abel. But it's on this fourth album of theirs, Beside Myself, that I think he really turns up the notch with his religious messaging and his interpretation of beliefs and scriptural stories. 
And for me, this kind of feels like the central theme of the album. Someone kind of learning about their beliefs, coming to know what they want to do for themselves in the world and how they want to interpret the meaning of their life. So if we go through some of the songs on the album and their lyrics, I can show you what I'm talking about. Obviously, there's the first song on the album and the first single called Disconnect, which is my favorite song on the album, which alludes to a biblical story of the prodigal son, which was one of the parables taught by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And obviously, the chorus of that song shouts, my prodigal son, what have you done? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the prodigal son story later in the video. Next up, there's nothing left, which I think pulls quite evidently from scripture, especially in the second verse, when it says, if I must, I confess this, my sin is crimson red. Have I fallen far too far to be forgiven? And in the chorus, hey, this is my mistake. The last one I will ever make. I'll take all that I could take. There's nothing left for me to say. I think some of the words in this song are a clear pull from a verse in the Bible where Isaiah compares sin to crimson red, which I'll put up on the screen here for you. The song Ultraviolet I've heard is apparently about Andrew's reaction to the Manchester terror attacks, which were unfortunately... Uh, religiously involved to a degree. The little middle song called Changing Lanes, which is just an acoustic piece, I think alludes more to beliefs, especially the end of the song where he says, I close my eyes and drive as I pray, drive as I pray. Then there's stigmata, obviously, and if you're not sure of what the word stigmata is, it alludes to the, the sign of the mark in Jesus Christ's hand when he was put on the cross and crucified. And I think to some degree, Andrew is using that as an analogy, maybe trying to see if he can get anything out of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ when it comes to his own mental demons. Then there's New Coast in verse 2, which says, Grace, I knew her once. She helped me stand up tall and pride. He's a funny friend who laughs before you fall. They're telling me that I should drink up every drop. What does it mean to be free? I think clearly um, that's talking about religious beliefs and grace and pride are often spoken of um, as topics of religion. Up next, there's Just a Life, which, I mean, is quite clearly a song about the meaning of life, a huge religious topic in the chorus. Is this just a life for all of us to lead? Is this just a life for all of us to lead? Are we writing verses we'll never get to read? Are we busy working for things we do not need? Is this just a life for us to lead? Andrew clearly, you know, questioning the meaning of his own life. Then going towards the end of the album, Reason for Breathing comes in, which is kind of interesting because I feel like it's almost the heaviest song on the album um, and most akin to their older work where they were a little bit heavier. But the song that's probably the most clearly about Andrew kind of, I think, talking about his belief potentially in God. When he says in the chorus, how can I begin to understand the hand that moves the sun around me? You are the sun. I am your son. You are the sun. I think he's kind of talking about God, or at least someone's belief in God. Then, of course, there's the last track right here, which I've also heard can be interpreted to be about a relationship and the issues with that. But I also think that it could be interpreted to be about a relationship with beliefs and how some people cling on to the beliefs and maybe start to question things and then maybe come back or maybe stray away. When he says in the chorus, it's only us controlling us. We are free. I'll be right here. And then in verse two, please, will you try to see there is no sense hiding from honesty. Believe in make believe. And we can all be that which we can be. I think it's kind of talking about someone, you know, coming up with their own belief and coming to the terms with it. So overall, when I hear this album and I kind of go over the lyrics, it just makes me think, what was Andrew Fisher going through when he wrote these songs? He, he must have had a lot on his mind, potentially about his beliefs, his, his mental health, and, and potentially what he was contributing to the world that he's in as a person or, you know, potentially... As a Christian person, I'm once again not sure if he is, but 
he certainly knows quite a lot about Christian doctrine from my understanding of his lyrics. But what I think he does so well with his lyric writing and the themes of this album is that he presents his lyrics mostly in kind of question format. And when you think about beliefs, whether that be, you know, someone who might believe in a God or someone who does not believe in a God and writing a song about that concept, I think that if you can approach that in a way that's kind of like questioning things or um, presenting the listener with questions, it's far more interesting. If you think about one of the most famous song opening lines of all time, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, for example, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? It's a good example of how, you know, saying a question in the lyrics is, a, is an engaging way of presenting it to the listener. When it comes to religious beliefs, I'll give you examples of both spectrums. When I hear the kind of like modern Christian contemporary music that you might get out of like Hillsong, I kind of just cringe every time I hear it because to me, it's just like too affirmative. It's obviously saying, you know, there is a God, I believe there's a God, and that makes me feel good, you know, and that's fine if someone believes that, but when that's presented to me as a listener and consumer of music, I don't find it very interesting and I find it a little cringy. And then on the other perspective, when there might be an artist who wants to make a song about how they don't believe in God and, you know, God isn't there, and if they just present that as their message, I, I almost have the same response that, you know, it's kind of cringy, it's kind of basic, and it's not really engaging to me. For example, there's a band that I often speak about on my channel that I really love, and that band is Violent Soho, and on their first album, that was one of the central themes of their work because they had a Christian upbringing, the members of that band, and I think they really wanted to get a lot off their chest when they decided they didn't believe in God anymore. And their first album, a lot of the songs were about, you know, how they just didn't believe in God anymore. And to me, that made the album a little bit less interesting than their later work, which was more about their surroundings in Brisbane. I'll give you some other examples of artists and songs that I think do this messaging about beliefs really well in this kind of questioning format. Another Australian band that I've spoken a little bit before of on this channel is Gang of Youths, who have a Christian background and often write music about Christian beliefs, but I think they do it a lot better than Hillsong in that the lead singer Dave Leal Pepe presents questions to the listener and shows the listener that he's thinking things through and he's not sure how things are, but he wants to work them out. And in my opinion, one of the greatest achievements in songwriting when it comes to Christian beliefs would be the song Jesus Christ by Brand New. Well, Jesus Christ, I'm alone again. So what did you do those three days you were dead? If you haven't heard this song, I'd highly recommend you check it out. But essentially, it's a song about a person who's kind of praying to Jesus, asking this potential metaphoric Jesus person, you know, what's my purpose in life? Are you really there? And because it's presented in kind of question format, I personally find it really engaging as opposed to, you know, a Hillsong singer just saying, Jesus is there, I love Jesus. So that's the reason why I think, to me, this album works so well, because basemen are able to tap into that. They're able to create lyrics that are engaging and that are thought-provoking um, and, you know, although they're about religious messaging and that might not be, you know, everyone's cup of tea or everyone's interest, they're able to do it in a way that, you know, makes you think about what Andrew was going through and what Andrew's interpretation of the meaning of life might be. Now I want to track back to the prodigal son story because I think this is also one of the overarching messages of the album and I'll refer back to the Kill Your Stereo interview that he did where the interviewer asked him about the lyrics in Disconnect and The Prodigal Son. See mate, this is the really interesting thing. I have the choice now on whether or not you're right or wrong and then it gets out there into the world and I have to think about if I want that to happen because as soon as I say it, how people will interact with it might change. But I don't want to hide it either. In that song, I am the prodigal son. I'm talking to myself. The song's about me constantly having to feel what it's like to be in a band 
and trying to hold on to what got me here in the first place, not letting all the little silly stuff get in the way and making me jaded. I'm reminding myself, I'm telling myself that it's okay to have those feelings because it's okay to then forgive yourself and carry on. If you're not aware of the story of the prodigal son, it's basically a parable that Jesus Christ taught to help people understand what could be done with those who choose to move away from faithful beliefs and potentially come back. So there's, the story goes, there's a family and a son who decides to leave and go to be of the world and to eat, drink, and be merry. He then comes back and is greeted by his father with open arms, and the father, you know, loves him again. And I think when Andrew in that interview says that he feels like he's the prodigal son, and he kind of alludes to his feelings about how he can relate to that being in a band, I also think that he probably, you know, relates that to his own life and potentially his own beliefs here about, you know, how he's kind of toing and froing. And the, the impression I get is he, he might be the sort of person who had kind of Christian religious upbringings and has gone back and forth and is not sure where he's at. You know, although he's he's got questions and he's not sure about everything, he's able to see the good things in there too. And he knows that he'll be okay because his family and his friends will accept him. That's just kind of how I interpret the song Disconnect, and I think that's the overarching message I get throughout the whole album, especially when you listen to each song all the way through, it kind of goes through this story of, I'm this person, I've got these beliefs, I've got these questions, I'm kind of still thinking there might be a God out there, I don't know what to do about it, but hey, I'll be okay, I'll be right here, like at the end of the album, and it goes full circle, back to the prodigal son, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm still here, and, you know, people are still going to love me for who I am. So that's why I think this is such a great album. I just think that it, it it's able to get that message across so well, and, I mean, there's, there's other reasons why it's awesome too. The music is great, the sound of this album is just awesome. I really like how they honed the guitars back just a little bit on this album compared to their last three it's just a little bit more gentle sounding. It breathes a little bit better. The drums sound so crisp and amazing too. In my opinion, this is their best album, and I think it beats out Color Me and Kindness, despite the fact that's also a great album. But the sad thing is, we really haven't seen anything of Basement for the past five years, apart from one appearance at a show called Outbreak Fest that's recorded on YouTube, which you can see, and they didn't actually play any of the songs from their last album on it. I think they were kind of paying homage to their Color Me and Kindness album, which is their most popular. And I'm not really sure where the band's at. They may never release music again. I'm not sure if Andrew Fisher's got back into teaching religious education and he's spending more of his time there. I know one of the other band members is in another group that's doing quite a lot of stuff now and he's taken up a lot of his time there. I just personally feel this album is incredibly underrated and now that five years have passed, I feel like it should be getting more recognition now and I go on Spotify and I see that this album is nowhere near listened to as much as their last three. When I personally think of some of the best kind of like emo sounding albums of the past, five to 10 to 15 years, I think this has got to be in the top two or three or five. And I think something that's really interesting about what many people will consider to be the greatest emo albums collectively of all time, like your American Footballs, your Sunny Day Real Estate Diaries, and your Jimmy Eat World Clarities, is that those three albums all kind of had this growth in popularity over time and they weren't really received with a lot of popularity initially. I think the same thing could actually happen here with Beside Myself. In 10 years, we might look back and see this album as Basement's best work and one of the most quintessential emo albums of the 2010s. I mean, that's essentially what's happened with the album Clarity by Jimmy Eat World, which when it was released was completely ignored. And it wasn't until they started to get more fame from their next album, Bleed American, that Clarity seemed to pop back up into the musical zeitgeist 
and now it's considered to be one of the greatest emo albums of all time. So if you haven't already, I would highly recommend listening through Beside Myself, Basement's fourth album. I hope you enjoyed as much as I do, and I hope you enjoyed this little video about the album and me going through it. And if you haven't already, can you please subscribe to my channel? I talk about mostly Australian music, but I do want to kind of branch out and talk about music generally as well. And I guess this is my first attempt at giving that a go. And hey, I think I would like to talk more about other albums that aren't Australian um, that I really connect with too. So if you like this, please subscribe and feel free to comment your opinions too. Thanks. Bye.